Hello. 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 Good afternoon. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much to Dan, David, and Patrick for inviting me. It is very exciting to be here, and in huge part because I am an alumna of the course. I was here two years ago. So I've been in your position, and I know you're exhausted, and you've had a lot of information thrown at you, and I'm going to throw some more at you. So uh, get some coffee, and, and, and let's go. OK. So just to give you an outline of, of what I'll be discussing, I'm going to do a review of epigenetic modifications. I know that Andrea touched on that, but just to give you a little bit more um, to kind of give it to you again so that you can really start to understand some of the biology. Uh, then I'll talk about DNA methylation measures from microarray data. So how DNA methylation data is actually measured and quantified and what it looks like. And then I'm going to, I chose kind of three hot topics in social epigenomics. Uh, and uh, these are epigen epigenome-wide association studies, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, and epigenetic clocks. And then uh, if we have time at the end, hopefully, we'll, we'll have um, some discussion. So my lecture goals for you all is, is really a basic understanding of these three topics that I chose. I chose them because they're of great interest to social scientists but they're also um, kind of really hot area, areas of debate among geneticists. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, I think it's, it's good because you know, there's a lot of critique in genetics about some of these topics that we're gonna discuss. And so it's then helpful to think as a social scientist, how should I be incorporating uh, these data and, and should I dive into these topics or where, where do we need to work on uh, some of these topics? And so with that kind of the state of the knowledge, what do we know, what don't we know? I put develop a critical sociogenomic eye, uh, which I really kind of define is, uh, as being a social scientist who can also go and, and read the biological literature, really understand the biological processes uh, that are involved, especially with this really more complex omics data. So with uh, DNA methylation data, RNA-seq data, proteomic data, et cetera, um, because I think that's really critical to understanding um, issues with the data and how we can actually interpret the data. And I think there's also huge room uh, and, uh, for overlap and, and kind of work, uh, interdisciplinary work with geneticists as SSGAC has done, uh, really pulling people and biology and everything in, into their research to really inform what they're doing. Uh, and then hopefully maybe stimulate some research ideas. And uh, hopefully at the end, like I said, we'll have some time to talk because I'd really love to hear how you as social scientists think uh, you might be able to contribute to the field of, of epigenetics. So uh, first, just to review some uh, of the kind of um, work that Andrea talked about of, of the biology. First of all, what is epigenetics? So formally, this is defined as a study of mitotically or meiotically heritable changes in gene expression that cannot be explained by changes in the DNA sequence. And there are two aspects of that definition that are really key. The first is heritability. So these DNA modifications must be passed on to daughter cells if they are to be considered epigenetic. And we'll talk more about that. And the second is changes in gene expression. So the fact that these modifications actually have a regulatory influence on transcription. So they actually have a, a role in, in modifying gene function. Is that clear to everybody? When you say it's passed on to daughter cells, do you mean both mitosis and meiosis? Um, so, so more, more in the sense of mitosis. With meiosis, it's, it's kind of more referring to things like genomic imprinting. Um, but with mitosis, kind of more in the sense of mitosis. So that every time that the, the daughter cell, uh, the parent cell divides into two daughter cells, that the newly synthesized strand is going to then acquire those same methyl marks. And I'll show you that. So it's not just in one generation of cells. What does the epigenome do? Uh, well, as it turns out, us mammals, we have a huge DNA packaging problem. So we have 6.5 feet of DNA that has to fit into a nucleus with a di diameter of approximately six micromolars. So I don't think in micromolars, so I looked up what a micromolar actually is. It turns out it's one millionth of a meter. So think about that for a second. 6.5 feet of DNA into kind of six millionths of a, <laughs> six millionths of a, of a meter. Uh, so, so how is that done? Uh, and so that's what the epigenome does, is it actually packages DNA into two forms, euchromatin, uh, and this is kind of transcriptionally competent 
DNA or easy to read DNA, DNA that's open, that the transcriptional machinery can then attach to um, and, and, and read the DNA and, and create an RNA transcript. And then heterochromatin, and this is transcriptionally inert or hard to read DNA. And so the, the, the epigenome is kind of always dynamically changing the structure of the DNA so that the genes that need to get read can get read. And so it's really maintaining this, again, this proper packaging and transcription of the genome across cell division cycles. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So types of epigenetic regulation, I think uh, Andrea touched on all of these, DNA methylation, uh, histone tail modifications or chromatin accessibility. That's, again, kind of the folding of, of um, or the wrapping of DNA, I should say, around nucleosomes, and then tighter into chromatin and then into a chromosome so it can all fit into the nucleus. Uh, and then there's also non-coding RNAs that have epigenetic function um, that can actually you know, block the transcription of genes by just binding to them. Um, so we won't talk about these last two. Today we're mostly just going to be talking about DNA methylation um, because that's really the most well-studied epigenetic process. Uh, I think it's much easier to collect data on and especially uh, for some of the larger, perhaps, uh, cohort studies that she'll be working with that have methylation data, it's going to be uh, data on DNA methylation. So we're just really going to be focusing on that. But just so that you know, there are uh, many types of, of epigenetic regulation. OK, so what is DNA methylation? So it's when a methyl group is added to the DNA molecule at cytosine bases. So here, there's a meth here's a regular cytosine. And then here, when the, the methylated, when the uh, methyl group is added, it actually becomes 5-methylcytosine because this is at the 5 position of the molecule. Um, and when this uh, methyl group is attached and when it's located in a gene promoter, it usually represses gene transcription. So it can also upregulate, but generally it represses transcription. In mammals, DNA methylation is almost exclusively found in CPG di dinonucleotides. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, a CPG is a C nucleotide that's followed by a G nucleotide in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So if you remember, DNA is read from the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So a CPG site is when there's a C, and then the P is the phosphate. That's because, if you remember, the DNA has a sugar phosphate backbone. So CPG. So that's a CPG site. Yes. Um, this, this, yeah, I don't know who did it last this, but so earlier it was mentioned in a previous session that CPG site is not a CPG. Yes. Um, no, and it's not. And actually, uh, the an interesting fact is that. Um, there's actually not a lot of these in the genome, and that's because uh, when um, the C is methylated, it can uh, de deaminate and become a, a T. And so it's actually much more mutagenic, and so evolution evolutionarily, there's then fewer of these, these sites in the genome. So um, they think that's why, because it's, it's more prone to mutation. Okay. So this is what I was talking about with it being maintained and passed on in daughter cells. You, you can see here we have all these methylated CPG sites. And then during DNA replication, there's a new strand that gets synthesized. And you can see this strand doesn't have methyl marks on it. And so then there are proteins that come and then stick methyl marks back on those cells to make sure that the daughter cells contain the same methylation patterns as the parent cell. And so that would be epigenetic. So if, if it doesn't get maintained in the daughter cells, then it's not considered an epigenetic regulation or process. And, and just with that, this is kind of more information than you really need, but I think it's just interesting and it's good to know. Um, there are enzymes or proteins um, that have different jobs. They either put down or kind of write the methyl mark, or they read the methyl mark, or they might even erase the methyl mark. So they're uh, the, these kind of... Uh, Epigenetic writers, readers, and erasers are just important to know about that they put down, maintain, and can also erase methyl marks. DNA methylation is really critical to development, right? I mean, because here we're controlling which genes are active with the epigenome. And so this plays a really key role in several cellular processes, including cell differentiation. So am I a blood cell? Am I a skin cell? Um, you know, ep the epigenome is, is kind of regulating uh, how cells differentiate themselves um, from the time that, you know, you're a fetus and, and, and you're developing. 
and then they maintain that cellular differentiation throughout your life course. Aging, which we'll talk about towards the end when we talk about epigenetic clocks, and then uh, cancer is, is a big one. I mean, these are just a few, but um, just so, you know, it is, it is uh, very critical to development throughout the life course and to disease. So what utility uh, might studying epigenetics have for social or health scientists? And here I just put a few, uh, and I kind of classified them into two groups. One is kind of as a mediator or a modifier of an environmental exposure. So it could be that the environment you know, is, is changing something on the epigenome, and then that's you know, conferring a risk for disease. Um, or it could be that it's somehow modifying the relationship between genotype and disease, you know, how genes are expressed. Um, and so this can really provide some mechanistic insights, uh, targets for uh, intervention, and, and in particular, it could perhaps illuminate gene environment interactions a little bit more which, in terms of what's going on. I think perhaps a little bit more promising is, is as a biomarker. Um, so, you know, it could be that, you know, the environment is, is modifying epigenetics somehow. We're not really sure what, what the causal direction is, that this is then affecting disease, but that this is some kind of reflection of what's going on in this process. And so it might actually help us kind of expand the reach of our exposure measurement um, and, and also reduce misclassification errors. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we might want to use a biomarker um, of epigenetics in, in research. So uh, now I'm going to move on to DNA methylation measures for microarray data. And I don't think you guys covered any, did you talk at all about, I don't think you guys covered that, okay. So how is DNA methylation measured and actually quantified? Um, so there's several different types of epigenetic assays, but um, I'm going to highlight two. The first is a methylation bead chip. So this is, uh, was the 450K array. It's now been replaced by the EPIC array. Uh, so this is called a microarray. And what a microarray does is it uses fluorescent probes to quantify the percent methylation uh, at a certain CPG site after bisulfate conversion. And I'll talk, talk about in a second what that means. Um, but basically, methylated Cs are converted to Ts. Um, and, and that's then how you're distinguishing between methylated and unmethylated sites. Um, and so that's called bisulfate conversion. The EPIC array captures around 850,000 CPG sites across the genome. Um, and so the prior, the predecessor to the EPIC was the 450K, which captured around 450,000 sites. Um, most of the sites on the 850K do overlap with the 450K, and the 850K captures a lot more uh, enhancer regions, um, which has been an uh, exciting um, area of expansion in research. Another uh, kind of uh, type of epigenetic assay that might be used to look at um, DNA methylation is kind of deep sequencing approaches. So these would be whole genome bisulfate sequencing, um, also reduced representation bisulfate sequencing. And here what's done, it's much like uh, sequencing of the genome, you know, that type of deep sequencing. Um, but instead of just sequencing the genome as is, you're sequencing it after bisulfate conversion. So this uh, then en uh, enables you to calculate percent of methylated versus non-methylated reads. So those reads that are given out from, from sequencing. Large epidemiological cohorts tend to use microarray data. So this is like the health and retirement study, fragile families, ad health. Um, I don't know if UKB is actually collecting, I think, do they have epigenetic data yet? I don't think they do. I don't know. It. But they must. I don't know. But anyway, you know, big epidemiological cohorts like those. And, and really the pro to that is comparability across studies. And um, so you know that the same CPG sites are being measured in each study that you're looking at. Um, and of course, it's, it's much cheaper than deep sequencing approaches. Um, the cons to that would be that you're limited to the sites that are captured on the assay. And from speaking to a lot of epigeneticists, I think the, the way in which they chose these CPG sites, um, I don't want to say it was totally random, but I don't think it was. Um, a lot of times they don't kind of know. They choose ones that they think are going to be informative. Um, but it, it's not always as clear. So um, you're then just really limited to those sites, and, and that can be a drawback if you really want to study a specific gene, for example, and you, and you really want to look at the whole region around that gene. But so we're really going to be focusing in, in everything that I'm going to be talking about from here on. Um, you know, generally they're using microarray data. So I mentioned briefly bisulfate conversion. Uh, what is that? So what happens is that the, um, the 
the data are treated with uh, sodium bisulfate, and this converts unmethylated cytosines to uracil, while 5-methyl cytosine, so that methylated cytosine, is resistant to the conversion, so it stays a C. Um, and then the genomic data is subject to PCR ampl amplification, um, so you're, you then amplify the DNA, clone it, and, and sequence it. In the case of um, whole genome bisulfate sequencing, if it was microarray data, then um, that would be a different process, but both are um, bisulfate converted. Uh, and then uh, what happens is that the methylated Cs remain as Cs, as I said, while the unmethylated Cs are sequenced as Ts. So that's how you know whether or not um, the, site, the CPG site was methylated or not. So then what, what does the data output look like once it's all been nicely cleaned and QC'd? So we're just going to skip over all the QC process, which is quite complicated with epigenetic data or can be, um, and just talk about, say, then you're just looking at the epigenetic data. What is it? What are you looking at? What, what, are, what is it measuring? And so typically what you get are these beta values and these M values. Um, the beta values are really the percent of methylated cells at a CPG site. And so it's uh, the total number of methylated cells within a pool of cells divided by the number of methylated and unmethylated. And so then if you multiply that by 100, it's the estimated percentage of cells that are estimated at the CPG site. For me, it was really key to understand that you're looking at this within a pool of cells. So it's kind of much like when we pool together a bunch of people and we take the average. Here you're pooling together a bunch of cells and you're kind of almost taking kind of the average or percentage level of methylation amongst all these cells. And that's important to understand because we're going to talk a little bit more um, about some of the confounders in, in, in the analysis, in, in epigenetic analysis, um, and one of them is kind of the composition of cells. So it's important to understand that. Yes? Say that again? So like, what kind of species Yeah, that's a good question, and, and, um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more as well. Um, but typically, uh, it's collected from blood or saliva, but the methylome is different in each tissue type. And so, you know, usually you can only, especially in these large epidemiological cohorts, where you're going to interview them about you know, okay, how much do you make and what's your income and, you know, are you working? And by the way, can I take your blood? You know, this, this type of stuff. You can't like sit there and be like, oh, can I take a tissue sample of your bone? So, or whatever. So they, they generally, you know, can at most get blood. And that's, you know, um, how that tissue is then handled and processed and everything is also very important within that first 24 hours to the methylation. So the data are quite fragile. Um, but uh, yeah, so, Tissue type does matter a lot, and I'll touch more on that. But typically in these larger studies, it's, it's blood so or saliva. Blood. Yes, and saliva is less stable, I think, especially for examining methylation. Blood is more the gold standard or what's preferred. Um, and uh, unlike DNA, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, you can also get these M values, um, and that's just the ratio of methylated to unmethylated. Um, I think beta values are more often used because they're just more biologically intuitive and meaningful, um, but the M values have nicer statistical properties for testing differential methylation. So a lot of this kind of depends on your study design. Um, are you looking at you know, methylation between two groups? Do you want to test the difference in methylation and so forth? Um, and with these M values, uh, if you take the log base 2 of the M value, it's normally distributed, and so that's why. Um, for certain tests, you might want to use the M value. So as it turns out, methylation microdata are messy. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, this kind of just touches on what we were just talking about. Uh, with genotype data, we know the data are discrete. So for example, you're getting a readout that shows whether at a given SNP you have 0, 1, or 2 A alleles. Um, there's reasonable QC cutoffs. And uh, DNA is really stable over the life course, and it doesn't vary across tissue types. With DNA methylation microarray data, you're looking at a continuous measure, so it's kind of the percent of methylated cells at a given CPG site. Um, it can be very sensitive to underlying genetics, uh, environment, and experimental conditions, or batch effects, they're often called. Um, and, and like I said, even to how it's handled. 
So for example, I have a little bit of like insight into how they collected the methylation data for the HRS, which will hopefully be released in the fall. And uh, sorry, there's a fly that just keeps not crazy. Okay. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know they had to go. They did a they did a random collection. You know they went into people's homes. They did a pilot study all across the U.S. They uh, collected their blood and then they had to ship it within 24 hours to a lab that was uh, I believe in Minnesota that they're using. Um, so they really had to coordinate that well. Um, and and with DNA you just don't have those same problems. DNA is just really stable. Um, there's different QC procedures, so it's a totally different ball game than working with genotype data. Um, and the cutoffs are not always straightforward and, and can really vary in terms of what people think is, is the right thing to do for QC across studies. Um, and as, as we mentioned, the epigenome varies across tissue types. And so you really have to think, is, is blood a good proxy for what I'm looking at? So for example, maybe I'm really interested um, in cognition. Ideally, you might want brain tissue, but that's gonna be really hard to get. You're not gonna get brain tissue. Um, so you have to think, is, is the type of tissue, uh, you know, if I'm using blood, is that going to be good enough uh, in terms of what I want to look at? Okay, so now I'm going to move into the, the three topics that I want to discuss. Uh, the first is EWAS. Um, so what is an epigenome-wide association study? How many people in here have heard of an EWAS, know what an EWAS is? Okay. Patrick and Dan, okay, good. Other people, um, great. So uh, it's really just a genome-wide scan for associations between a phenotype and altered DNA methylation at usually thousands of, of CPG sites across the genome. Again, if it's on the 850K array or something, it would be 850,000 sites. And typically what they're doing is they're regressing the beta methylation value, which is again, the percent methylation of the CPG probe in a pool of cells on the phenotype and covariates. And so what's interesting to notice here is that the CPG site is usually the dependent variable, unlike with the GWAS where it's the independent variable. And I think that's really just because they're thinking about the causality in that direction, not to say that it is causal, but that's kind of more the model. Um, I guess also because it's continuous, you, you can put it on the left-hand side easier than with, with genetic data. And the typical covariates here that you're using, so in a GWAS, we always control for population stratification, and there's these things that we always put in there. Um, in EWAS, it's usually sex and age, because those are two really huge um, uh, drivers of methylation patterns, right? Females have very different uh, methylation than men, um, especially because of the, the X chromosome. Uh, and uh, age, methylation patterns change a lot with age. We'll talk about that again. Smoking is a, is a huge one. Smoking has really been shown to, to change and alter the methylome. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, because we haven't talked, to, we'll talk about it in a second. Cell type proportions, um, array number, and position on array. And those are usually kind of controlling for, for batch effects that might confound the analysis. Okay, so just to give you an example of an EWAS, um, so smoking is, is something that has really been shown to leave a long-term signature um, on the, the methylome. So there have been many EWAS that have been done of smoking behavior. Um, here are just two recent citations. Um, and, and really across these EWAS, they are tending to find reproducible CPG associations. Um, so they do seem to be uh, kind of time and time again finding the same CPG sites. Um, and if you look at the genes that are annotated to these CPG sites, they tend, tend to be enriched for associations with smoking-related traits that have been found in GWAS. So genes that are related to pulmonary function, for example, uh, cancers, heart disease, uh, that sort of thing. And what they also find when they look at current versus former smokers is that there seems to be a persistent pattern of that methylation, um, which they think perhaps is from smoking. Um, in former smokers. So even after you stop smoking, there are certain sites that will continue to be methylated um, you know, across the, the life course. So because of this, and I, I was just talking to Tonu about this before the break, methylation at these CPGs could really serve as, as biomarkers of lifetime exposure to tobacco smoke. And, and why is that exciting? And is, is uh, that you know, perhaps people um, might not in a, in a survey data, perhaps they might say they smoke, 
but or say that they didn't smoke, but perhaps they do, or maybe they were exposed to a lot of smoke exposure in the home, maybe their parents smoked, and that's not a question that was asked on the survey. So it might be a really interesting way of, of being able to get at um, people's behavioral patterns that aren't self-reported. Um, is there a quite there are two questions? Okay. Simple question about like how how, you know, how should we interpret this? Like well, what's going on with this? With the with the EWAS, you mean? Or, or no, and then suddenly there's more regulation of the sun specific type mm -hmm. in my in DNA. In my Yeah, yeah, that that's attached to the DNA. So how should we think about this? Like what's going on biologically? Do we know? That's a good question. So in terms of like why, what caused those methyl marks to be put down? And why, why those, those patterns? And why those, so I don't think, and, and um, Tono and Andrea can jump in if they know more here, but I've spoken to epigeneticists, you know, molecular epigeneticists and asked them what actually causes, so remember there were those writers, readers and erasers to put down the methyl mark. So we know, okay, this protein comes and it puts down the methyl mark, but why, what causes it to do that? And they say, we don't know. So, so there's a lot that we don't know molecularly uh, that we're just kind of assuming or, or kind of jumping over in these, in these large studies. Is that, yeah, for anyone else that knows something? Yeah. Um, in the methylome, is there any notion of non additivity So like, have you, like methyl, methyl group, methyl group interaction? Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sure there is. I, I don't know, though. That's not something I know, but that's a good question. I'm sure that, the, yeah. But it's on the left-hand side of the regression line, and so uh, it's not a, you know, before we, we had a model where we had like, you know, phenotype and then a bunch of SNPs, but since we're putting the method groups on the left-hand side, it's not totally clear what an interaction would mean, right? Right. But just, yeah, no, that's, it was statistically, yeah, that's true. And, but in, in terms of biologically, whether they might be in, working together to kind of do something, I think that's, you know, could be definitely true. Um, more questions before we go on? Okay. Um, and then uh, interest, there's, a, there's some work now that's being done to develop polyepigenetic scores. So that's kind of much like a polygenetic score, but using results from EWAS to kind of uh, actually create a score um, that kind of is kind of a summary of you know, methylation patterns across the genome. Um, so there's some that have been developed recently by Karen Sugden and, and Caspi at Duke University. I think they published this now. If you guys are interested, I can, I can look more into it. Um, but so that's something that is starting to, you know, come around a little bit more. Um, but <laughs> so now let's talk a little bit about the critique of EWAS. So what can, what can we really say? So I would say, you know, there's a lot of promise here, but um, there's been growing controversy in the field over kind of EWAS study design. And, and I think you guys will be really able to understand this really well because you've spent the whole past week talking in depth about the assumptions behind GWAS. Um, and so what I assigned were two articles. Um, and so if you haven't had time to read them and you're interested, I would highly recommend them because I think um, they both, you know, I think first of all, the, the New York Times article is short, it's sweet, and it just kind of gives a really media-based perspective on this controversy. And in the Times article, they cite these researchers' work and they talk to them. And so this was uh, Ewan Burney, George Davy Smith, and, and John Greeley. Uh, and so they just wrote this kind of summary review paper in I think PLOS One or PLOS Genetics about some of the controversies that, that have emerged. And so I'm gonna kind of summarize a lot of what they say in these, in these next few slides. Uh, so EWAS is kind of like GWAS, except <laughs> first, you know, our genome stays constant over our lifetime, uh, with the exception of, of somatic mutations like cancer that might arise. Um, and so because of that, we can't really say that phenotype associated events change our genotype, right? That doesn't really happen. Um, also with GWAS, genetic variants are usually randomly assigned with, the respect, with respect to the characteristics of an individual, you know, kind of assorted of mating aside or conditional on the parent's genome. Uh, and so because of that, the, because of this kind of consistency and random assignment, there's really uh, more room to kind of permit a causal interpretation of GWAS results, or at least we can be a little bit more sure about the directionality of the results, right? Um, but in EWAS, that's, that's not the case. So in EWAS, there's definitely problems um, with reverse causation. So uh, here, this is, I just took this from the paper. You know, maybe the cellular hypothesis is that there was some sort of stress and that changed the methylation pattern. Um, and that then caused the phenotype. But it could be that the phenotype, you know, some sort of disease, is actually itself changing the methylation patterns 
and, and disease has, you know, different diseases have been shown to actually change our methylome. So that's quite, you know, especially cancer, for example. So that's, that's quite plausible. And, and that's not something that an EWAS can address. The other thing might be omitted variables that, you know, a third variable that's influencing DNA methylation or the phenotype that, that's just not controlled for in the study design. Oh, actually, I have two slightly related questions. Um, one thing is, uh, Given sort of the price of like whole genome bioprocessing chip, is uh, are the scales of the methylation data sets easier? Like, I imagine they're smaller or am I? There, yes, definitely. Right now, there's just not nearly as many uh, epigenome samples or you know that are collected relative to genetic data. My second question was related to sort of using epigenomics as a covariate, or not exactly a covariate, but as one of the factors in GWAS study. So like a combined GWAS uh, with epigenetics, sort of controlling for epigenetics, because I mean, if, if there is a silencing effect associated with that um, in the proximity of certain SNPs, I mean, that's that is something that could potentially have. I mean, we don't know. I guess I imagine there's, there's not a clear idea of whether it's causative or just a byproduct. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and I don't. So I haven't heard of any GWAS that have started controlling for methylation, but I think. The opposite, and I'll talk a little bit in a second about the genetic influence on the epigenome. I think the opposite controlling for genetics in EWAS studies is definitely something that's starting to kind of be thought about more and done in some research because of the tight connection between the two. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, the third problem is the tissue issue, as was, as was brought up earlier, as a colleague of mine calls it, um, who's an epigeneticist. Uh, and um, this is just that each tissue type, so whether it's blood, saliva, muscle, has a different epigenome. And so the tissue sample that you're looking at in EWAS may not actually even really be capturing uh, the phenotype of interest in, in the best way possible. So again, really thinking about, you know, I'm looking at a pool of blood cells or a pool of white blood cells on and how that's related to cognition. You know, are we really going to see dramatic differences there um, in, in the epigenome? Um, and then this is a really huge confounder, a really important thing to understand if you're, if you're looking at epigenetic data, and that is this issue of cell subtype heterogeneity. Um, so as I, I mentioned, we have pools of cells. And so if we're looking, for example, at white blood cells, so if, if they um, take blood and they do DNA methylation, they're going to be looking at white blood cells because red blood cells don't have a nucleus. Um, so you would then, in a pool of white blood cells, have granulocytes and non-granulocytes. So these are subtypes of white blood cells. So things like neutrophils and basophils, lymphocytes, monocytes. So each of these subtypes are going to have a distinct epigenome. And so what can happen uh, then if you pull all these cells together and you don't take into account the composition of these cells is that kind of the different proportions of cells sampled um, could actually generate DNA methylation profiles that are not a result of some sort of underlying cellular stress, but actually the proportion of the cells that are being measured. And so it's really important to adjust for cellular subcomposition. What's ideal is to be able to just have one cell subtype. So generally, they'll, they'll only look at methylation in monocytes. But that's even more expensive because you have to then purify, um, you have to sort the cells uh, after you draw the blood and, and make sure you're just getting monocytes. So I know, for example, with the HRS data that's coming out, that was too expensive. So they also have, of course, flow cytometry data um, on the blood so you can adjust for the proportions of cells. So you know the flow, the flow cytometry tells you what the, the proportion of cell types was in the blood. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. How about we do know that the epigenome stable at the subtype level? Well, it could still change at the subtype level. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, you have all these different moving parts uh, in that sense. Uh, another challenge is that, um, you know, most changes in, in DNA methylation are quite modest. So you, you really tend to see this bimodal distribution when you look at the data where um, the majority of loci within a pool of cells are either 0% methylated or 100% methylated. And so, for example, if you see, you know, at a CP CPG site, 20% methylation, that means 20% of the cells uh, are methylated. 
So, and, and for example, that's even if you're looking just at monocytes. So even if you're just looking at one type, one cellular subtype, and you see that 20% of the cells are methylated, that means that there's some sort of cellular mosaicism that's going on, or you know that some of the cells are methylated and some aren't. Um, and I think that that's even still kind of being understood. What does that mean, and, and how how should we interpret that? But it's hard to detect these changes. But I have a couple of fast questions. Like first for this graph, this makes life easier, right? If it's accurate because it's either on or off. Mm -hmm. The second one, like, as you mentioned, that the epigenome is very dynamic, it's not static. Like, do you have an idea about the temporality and how fast it could change? Is it a matter of hours or years? That's a good question. Um, I, and I, I'm not sure. I think it would really depend on the type of mark, on the gene, on the exposure. Um, I think a lot, most methyl marks, I think I, one epigeneticist told me that 80% of our methyl marks are put down in utero. So, and, and they tend to stay stable throughout the life course. So I think, you know, many of them never change. Uh, and then there are some that change. So, so most of them will always have this zero one. And then there are about, I think, 20% that, that can fluctuate. So, but in terms of how long it takes them, I'm not sure. Yeah, I just want to ask something. Yeah. I've heard about this experiment that they ask people to exercise and mm. to, um, blood before and after so two hours intensity and you could that within two hours. Oh wow. And then but it would have to then replicate to the daughter cells for it to be considered a full epigenetic change. So it might be that like, oh okay, well, yeah, I'm methylated now, but whether or not then it's gonna, you know, I like <laughs> I'm methylated, but then you know, uh, I don't want to you know, I don't know, then maybe that little reader, writer, eraser, whatever won't come down and do its job. So um, yeah, so whether the, the methyl marks persist, I wonder if they've looked at that. Um, so, and this, this sixth one I think is really important because um, what many people don't know is that there's a huge genetic influence on the epigenome. Um, so SNPs known as methylation quantitative trait loci or MQTLs. I think you guys talked a little, little bit about EQTLs. Who remembers what an EQTL was? <laughs> Expression, so those are SNPs that influence gene expression, and these are SNPs that influence methylation. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot more about EQTLs and MQTLs, so then you'll know when you hear that. Um, and, and they've been estimated to account for anywhere between 22 and 88% of the variability that we see in DNA methylation. Uh, it can also be that transcription itself alters methylation patterns. So differences in gene transcription may generate DNA methylation changes that might be due to and not causative of transcriptional changes. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, the arrows are definitely going in both directions here on this, this you know, little diag that I drew. And so, you know, not controlling for these genetic influences could, could perhaps um, be misconstruing some of the variation that you're seeing, or there could even be, you know, causal effects going in the opposite direction. So, okay, EWAS are messy. Why bother? Oh, yes, okay. So I would just add to your, to your list of, of um, issues that uh, correlation between the phenotype you're interested in and other phenotypes could be driving the results. Yes. So we did, the SSJAC did an EWAS of educational attainment, which was motivated by this general view, the, the kind of popular view that everything affects the epigenome, all sorts of social interactions that happen all the time to us. So if that were true, we thought, well, educational attainment is a huge intervention. Like that should have big effect on the epigenome. So we did this EWAS, mm -hmm. and we found we actually found a bunch of um, hits, but it turned out that they were all smoking related. Even though right. we had smoking controls, they're imperfect controls. controls. So they were either known to be related to smoking or parental mother's smoking. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so the results seem to just be entirely an artifact of the fact that educational attainment is correlated with smoking. Right, right. That's what, okay. That's what you meant by third variable. Yes, yes, yeah. No, that's a fabulous example of of uh, and, and was a very interesting paper on on that. So, um, yeah, those those smoking are so persistent that yeah, um, exactly. So it's just it's really hard to tease apart. Uh, someone, I think there was another hand. Yes. Sure. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you would use the coefficient on the phenotype and apply that to the to the methylation, yes. Yes, yes. It's yeah, it's just like a polygenic score in that. Yeah, there's instead of a SNP, you have columns of CPG sites and then the other column is is the percent methylation. Um, and then you would have a, a beta value and yeah, as far as I kind of understand it. Miles and then Sylvia. It sounds like uh, it would be a good idea to treat the smoking EWAS just like ECs are treated mm -hmm. in, in the, the other kind of analyses. And of course, that would mean it would be very important to get super accurate smoking EWAS if you're, if that's, if that's your PPC, then you've got to Mm -hmm. But that would be a good way to just routinely make sure that you're not getting smoking. Right, right. And I know there are, um, I think sometimes they do control for PCs of the epigenetic data. So, and, and those do gen tend to capture, the first one tends to capture smoking or, you know, the second one captures, I mean, just these major things, sex, smoking, and age are the three that have really huge effects and obesity too. Really, if you did I don't actually, I don't know that for sure, but I, I know that it does kind of come out as its own PC. So I'd have to take a look and at that, but, and the field is constantly changing in, in terms of the techniques and what they're doing. Um, so it's, yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Sylvia and then. No, I think just, just to make sure I understand the point that then that we're making, I guess the, the, the problem that it's, it's because of this reverse causality, right? It's because mm -hmm. the phenotype is affecting the epigenetic data. Is it that could why it, it could this be. is more of a problem in the EWAS than the GWAS? Is that the main of this confounding between the two types? Is that in principle could also be a problem with GWAS, right? I guess it's more of a problem with EWAS because of the Well, the phenotype couldn't really change the genotype. Right. Like you couldn't, you know, and like unless there was some sort of mutation right. like cancer and okay. I mean, perhaps it could, you know, but those mutations are, yeah, we just don't know. But generally it's not. Whereas I think with methylation, it's much more common for, you know, disease or something to actually change the methylome. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, okay, EWAS are messy. Um, so why should we bother? Okay. Um, so, you know, I think there is still this great promise that epigenetics can really generate new insights into disease mechanisms, right? It's, on, it's kind of on the pathway to disease, um, and, and precisely perhaps because of its mutability. Um, so someone described this once, and I, and I thought it was just a really great way of saying it. DNA methylation carves a time and context-dependent program. So we're not studying gene expression, but rather the potential for gene expression. So you can maybe see changes in, in, in methylation before you're actually seeing changes in gene transcription. And so that holds really huge appeal for treatment and, and for um, kind of actually treating disease, right? Um, and, and also I think that may, because of its mutability and it's kind of on this pathway, it might help us tease apart what's biological more and what's environmental. Um, and as I mentioned, it could help potentially detect and, re and reverse the onset of disease. And, and I think one of the really great potential for, for EWAS and, and, and general epigenetic data is as biomarkers of disease. So where you could actually take someone's blood and, and look at their methylome and see perhaps uh, if they're about to develop disease or control for it in a study rather than just asking someone if they've ever been exposed to cigarette smoke, et cetera. But I think to, to tease this all apart and just kind of wrap up on EWAS, I think better study design is needed. So I think in the field there's a huge call uh, for, for cleaner study designs and how we're looking at this. All right, so next I'm going to talk about transgener transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Um, so I assigned in other two articles. This first is this New York Times article um, that came out in 2018. Uh, and it's entitled, Can We Really Inherit Trauma? 
So, you know, I think this idea that perhaps what our ancestors were exposed to um, could affect, uh, you know, the, their descendants biologically has huge emotional appeal. And I think it's, it's just, you know, it's kind of just has gotten a lot of media attention um, and, of course, attracted a lot of social scientists into the pool. Um, but as, as he points out in here, the evidence, especially in humans, is really circumstantial at best. So what can we actually say about inheriting epigenetic marks? Um, and so with that New York Times article, I also assigned this paper, which I think is just a really nice um, review. It gets a little technical at certain points biologically, but if you just want to look at some of the DNA methylation parts, I think it's, they really kind of outline it very clearly. Um, and, and they really explain what is transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit so we can clear up what it actually means. Um, so technically, it is the generational uh, transfer of epigenetic marks. And why is that so kind of fascinating or interesting? Well, it's well known biologically that in each new generation, DNA methylation patterns are erased and reset. Um, this first erasure uh, is a kind of a global DNA methylation that occurs in the parental gametes, so in your eggs and, and sperm cells. And the second occurs after fertilization in the developing embryo. Um, and just as a side note, genomic imprinting is one exception to this epigenetic erasure. So genetic imprinting is kind of the passing of epigenetic marks, um, but it's considered as, as separate from this phenomenon of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So just put that aside for a second. Yeah. You might want to just explain what it is, because I don't think we talked about it. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so basically it's, it's just where, uh, and jump in if I'm explaining this, one um, gene either in the parental or the maternal line is, is silenced. And so for a time, I think it's usually um, in this first step um, that you will only be inheriting the epigenetic mark from the mother, for example. Um, and so that's often happened, I think, with um, X chromosome inactivation in the first step. Um, but it happens with other genes as well. Um, and I, yeah, so I'm, it's, it's, I'm not quite sure I totally understand it, to be honest, but it is basically that either the maternal or the maternal allele um, is epigenetically imprinted and that's inherited. Is that kind of, yeah, with your understanding? Okay. Um, so what uh, TEI, I'm just going to abbreviate it, is, is, is then is an incomplete erasing of epigenetic signatures, permitting the transfer of epigenetic marks from parents to offspring. And by the way, they think that this is kind of done biologically because they that the you know evolutionary, evolutionarily it's it's it wouldn't be good to inherit all these epigenetic marks from your parents. It's kind of giving a clean start to to the developing embryo. So there might be a biological reason that this happens, right? Um, and and what's really really important here to understand is that transgenerational epigenetic inheritance is often confused with epigenetic changes from intrauterine exposures. That's not the same thing. So the epigenome we know is particularly vulnerable to environmental factors during embryogenesis. So any methylation patterns that the fetus acquires because of the mother's health behaviors, like smoking, for example, um, that can be passed on to the fetus, and that's not considered transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So here we might see results and similarities between the epigenome of the parents and the offspring, but it's not because the fetus, um, you know, it's not because the mother inherited the epigenetic patterns from the grandmother and then they were passed to the fetus, but rather because of the inter intrauterine environment. Yeah, I'm just wondering if uh, because there are certain uh, certain notions that basically we agree sort of the parental age mm -hmm. does sort of impact the uh, health. So is that purely the risk of sort of de novo mutation or is it also a step? So I, I, um, I think there are some studies that are looking at whether there's epigenetics involved there, um, especially in the male sperm line. But as far as I know, most of that research is on de novo mutations. Um, so just the fact that, especially with sperm cells, they're just constantly replicating. And so by the time the, the man is 40, 45, there's a lot higher chance for things like, um, you know, uh, repeat disorders and so forth. And with female age, it's mostly the um, danger of trisomy 
um, and that also has a molecular mechanism, but we won't get into that. So, um, would twins have the same epigenetic marker, or is um, I I think they tend to be more similarly epigenetic uh, epigenetically at birth, but then they often show these pictures of twins over time that are genetically identical that look different, and that has been attributed to epigenetics. So over time, there is they have shown divergence in twins' epigenomes. Um, but they tend to be more similar at birth. OK, so just to recap the conditions that need to hold for transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So I'm going to look here in the female. Oh, this works now. Oh, but it doesn't, sh oh, it doesn't shine on the screen. OK, so the, um, uh, so, OK. So say that the female is exposed to stress. So say our research question is, did exposure to the Holocaust impact the epigenome of the grandchildren? So if the mom was exposed to the Holocaust and she was pregnant, you would have to show the, the inheritance of these epigenetic marks in four generations. And that's because the fetus has an epigenome, but also the fetus's developing germline has an epigenome. So both the mother, the fetus, and the fetus's germline could have, uh, you know, in utero, been affected by the Holocaust. And so we could potentially see in, in the grandchild, in the F2 generation, an effect of the Holocaust. But it wouldn't be because they were passed on through, you know, because of this complete pasher passing of the epigenetic mark. It would be because of the intrauterine exposure, which is a different thing. So if a female is pregnant, you have to be able to view um, this passing of epigenetic marks in four generations to be able to say that it's um, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. If the female is not pregnant, then it would be in three generations. And it's the same for the man. Is that clear? Uh, would you please repeat that again briefly? I didn't. The whole thing? Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, I can, uh, let me just, okay, so, because this is important to understand, so, um, I think the big, the big thing that people often confuse with transgenerational epigenetic inheritance is in uterine exposure. So if there's in uterine exposure, the mom, uh, the mom's kind of behavioral patterns or stress or trauma or whatever she's experiencing could impact, of course, the fetus, but it could also impact the fetus's germline. So the fetuses say developing eggs. Um, and so then it's possible to see in the F2 generation, which was the developing germline in the fetus here, it's possible to see uh, some sort of epigenetic patterns, um, but that could be the result of the in 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 intrauterine trauma. So we actually have to see it in four generations to, to make sure that it was not the result of intrauterine and to actually say that it was passed on, these epigenetic marks were passed on. If the female is not pregnant or if we're looking in the male germline, then it's, then it's three generations. So. What, well, it's, I mean, in the sense that, um, you know, it's just like with genes that you inherit, one allele, you know, one from your parents and one from your, you, you inherit the, the, the thought is, is that you're inheriting, when you inherit that allele, you're also inheriting the methylation status of that same, um, you know, chromosome. But in this picture, you could have an F1, F2, and F3. Those, those could be men or women. F1 one has to be. F1. No, it could be. No, no. The, 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 it's the eggs of the. It's the, the germline. It's yeah, the sperm box. But the germ, like the. the I mean, I guess I just don't. I, aren't there aren't there like cells and they can spawn from the cells that are generating all the sperm? Yeah. No, I think even it is it is slightly more complex because I know with eggs and I'm and this again the biologist can jump in because this is something I'm still trying to understand. But I think there even though um, it is I think a little bit more impact impactful on the ovo like on the egg than it is on the sperm. But the sperm can still inherit I think epigenetic patterns even though they're constantly replicating. So I think. The, 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 the developing germline, it doesn't matter if it's male or female. Oh, that's what you were asking, I think. Yeah. I, I, I think, yes. How strong the, the... Well, I'm glad you asked because that's my, that's my next slide. But one of the evidence, the evidence was 
that it only was serving me in her companion. Her new grandmother is the one that has to be exposed. This handle or the dragon was under my jaw that was very important. Interesting. That it, it has to be from the maternal line? I mean, I think maybe perhaps because of this intrauterine thing, but that's different than transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. But I mean, it could, it could also happen via the male germ line. It doesn't have to happen via the, the maternal. But I think then there, they're conflating intrauterine exposure with transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Um, so it's really difficult to study this in humans. Um, and to date, as far as I know of, there is no evidence of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance in humans. There is no evidence. Unlike animal models, you know, why is it so difficult to study? Well, the causality of the environmental exposure and the generational transmission are both really difficult to establish. So you would need longitudinal, multi-generational epigenomic, epigenomic data to show maintenance across three to four generations. And as far as I know, that doesn't exist yet with epigenomic data. So again, think about this picture. How would you model this picture with data? You would need multiple generations, longitudinal. You know, you'd have to control for the environmental exposures that all these other people had, their genetics, everything to show that it was truly the passage of just those epigenetic marks. I was going to say that even if you found some epigenetic markers on the fourth generation that were differentiated by whether the grand, grandparent was not, it still be Exactly, right. So you would still have to really have a clean study design in other ways as well. But just for the definition to hold, it has to be, you know, that you see it across, but yes. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really difficult to distinguish between inherited genetic factors that influence the epigenome and transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So it could be you're seeing these epigenetic patterns across generations because they all have the same SNPs that are influencing methylation at that site. So you would have to actually be able to somehow control for that. Um, just current evidence. So, you know, yes, there is evidence that nutrition, smoking, trauma, et cetera, could affect the grandchildren's phenotype or risk of disease. There's evidence showing similarities in epigenetic profiles between parent and offspring, even with causal studies like the Dutch hun hunger winter, the Quebec ice storm. But these are still not showing transgenerational epigenetic inheritance because they're not showing it um, in a, you know, there's no way that they could kind of control uh, or know whether these results, many times they're actually results from intrauterine exposure, for example. Um, uh, there can be genetic mutations, mutations in DNA repair mechanisms. Um, genetic mutations and epigenetic modifiers. So there's a lot of um, things that these studies are not taking into account, um, and, and so they can't really make the claim that it's transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Um, so that's kind of, you know, where it's at right now. We need more data. Wait, what about in mice? In mice, so yeah, there are there are some studies that have been done, but from my understanding, it's still kind of fuzzy in mice. Like they're not they're not totally getting there yet either, B partially because these, of these same genetic factors. They don't know, they, they still don't you know, know what SNPs, what MQTLs, for example, are influencing what methylation patterns, because you'd have to control for all of that. Although I guess with mice, they're all genetically identical. I don't know, but they're, they're still working it out. It's, they're not there yet. Is any, and if anyone else knows anything, jump in. I mean, it's, it's plausible, yeah. I mean, they're, if, it works, if they can find that it works in mice, it's plausible, but humans are a lot more complex, and so there could be other things that, you know, in humans, it's just a lot more difficult to prove because of all these other environmental factors, um, more complex genetic factors. Um, I, don't know, I don't know that it's nonsense, but there's huge skepticism, and it's just not, it's not something that the most biologists buy into right now because there's just no evidence of it, and because it really goes against the grain of this very established molecular erasure of the methylome. So it, it, you would really have to, to have very, very stunning evidence to show that this isn't the case. That's my understanding. Do you know Tonu much about any of this or have? Yeah, I think it's I'd say, well, I 
but the media have kind of latched onto it and social, I think it's really uh, increased a lot of attention to epigenetics because of that. So, but you all now know reasons for why you have to be a little bit more cautious. And even in the state, like, like similar attempts, like, like genetic, yeah. like, like in studies, uh, right. in 200 plus samples and tried to control them. Many times were. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, and finally, um, I have about 10 minutes. Uh, I'll go through epigenetic clocks, which I think are a, a much more promising area of, of research right now in epigenetics um, in terms of biomarkers. Um, so I signed this paper by Steve Horvath and Kenneth Raj. They do uh, a really great job. It was in Nature Reviews of reviewing the current state of the literature on epigenetic clocks. So if you're interested, I really highly recommend you take a look at the paper. Um, so, you know, ever since, the, I think, the 1980s, there's been this huge search for a biomarker of aging, some way that we can actually identify aging. And, and that's because, you know, we know that chronological age is really arguably the strongest risk factor for most chronic diseases. Um, but we know that it's a really imperfect measure of aging. So the aging process, for example, is not linear, but chronological age is. Um, and the rate of aging differs across individuals. So, you know, everyone is not, you know, you might see four people who are 50 and one person looks like they're 40, one person looks like they're 60. I mean, people age at different rates. And, and so how do we capture that kind of biological age? And the thought is that if there were really reliable, reliable biomarkers of aging um, that could capture the, the biological aging process, Again, we could elucidate factors that might be influencing aging, and this could lead to discoveries that could halt, slow, or even reverse the aging process. So this has been a, of huge interest, especially to the NIA, you know, uh, for, for a long time. So um, enter the epigenetic clock theory of aging. Again, just to define aging, it's a complex process that's characterized by increasing dysregulation and loss of function across multiple molecular levels and systems in the body. Uh, so, and what's been shown is that the epigenome actually exhibits really precise transformations with age. Um, so there does seem to be this uh, kind of molecular footprint uh, on the methylome of innate biological changes that are the result of or are giving rise to, again, we don't really know the causality of the aging process. Um, and so, because of this, measures of biological age that are based on epigenetic alterations have really emerged, uh, you know, in the past, you know, 10 years, or not even 10 years, you know, six years as, as promising biomarkers of, of aging. So there's been kind of an explosion of research on these epigenetic clocks. So you can call it an epigenetic clock or DNA methylation age. Can refer to it either way. I was confused by this for a while because the, the, they're used interchangeably. Um, and formally, what an epigenetic clock is, is just a composite methylation score of CPG sites that are highly associated with chronological age. Um, the first multi-tissue predictor uh, was developed by Horvath in 2013. Before that, there were epigenetic clocks, but they were just developed in one tissue type. Um, so he used 8,000 microarray samples what we've been talking about from over 30 different tissue and cell types that were collected from children and adults. This was all publicly available data that he used. Um, by, this, by the way, this is like a sole authored paper that he published um, in Cell, I believe, which was very impressive and, and had just, you know, made a huge boom in the, in the field. There's a really interesting story, though, about, well, I won't get into it. Okay, you didn't ask me afterwards. Um, but, uh, um, you know, what this has shown is that it's really able to predict epigenetic age across many tissues and cell types. So because he developed it across tissue types, he, the, and I'll show you again how they actually, um, you know, empirically did this, but he was able to uh, uh, pick CPG sites that are really highly associated with age across all tissue types. So kind of subvert this tissue issue. Um, and his clock contains 353 CPG sites that are highly correlated with chronological age. Um, so it exhibits up to like nine, you know, 0.95 correlation in adults, children, and even in prenatal samples. So the prenatal samples have actually been shown to have a negative epigenetic age. Um, and it's thought to really capture aspects of biological aging or more accurately epigenetic aging. Um, so uh, estimating DNA methylation age or the epigenetic clock. So what, what they do here is uh, these clocks are built by regressing chronological age 
on a set of CPGs using a supervised learning machine method. So this is like Lasso or ElastiNet, ElasticNet. And what um, ElasticNet does is it just uh, shrinks or constrains the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients that are all in the regression to be between some predefined value uh, between 0 and 1. And so the result is that uh, you know, the machine learning method is really only selecting the most informative CPGs for, for age prediction. Uh, and so he, from this method, was able to pull 353 CPG sites. He, he did it first, of course, in a training sample and then in a discovery sample. Um, and then what, how you then calculate the clock is you use those weighted linear average uh, of methylation levels, um, or I'm sorry, it's just the weighted linear average of methylation levels using these reg regression coefficients from this as the weights. And so that's just how you calculate methylation age. And he has like online calculators that do this for you and everything. Um, once you can just feed the data into it. Yes, Miles. Um, one, th one possible theory of what happens with age is, let, let's say you set the methylation to what it should be for the differentiation of the particular cell. And then with age, you just might have more divergences of that. So, so the question is then, if the, is the sign that you get in, in these kinds of regressions, typically in the direction of, of you know, away from, away from the edge. Like if you're a zero, it's a positive. You're mostly zero in that cell type, it's in the positive direction. If you're mostly one in that cell type, it's in the negative. Does, does what do you mean by zero and, oh, you mean in? Yeah, because that would go to the idea that oh, it's just an indicator of age rather than, rather than really causing age. If aging just kind of throw, creates mutation, right, in right, in, in the epigenome, so that they that they go away from the edge, right, right. No, and they haven't been able to say that this is causative in any way, but just that rather it's a really strong biomarker, or pre it's very predictive of chronological age. We know the correlation between whether the cell type is typically zero or one in the, in in the um, epigenetic marker and the peak. Right. I'm not sure. But there are ones that go in, I mean, they go in both directions. So you can have negative yeah. or positive coefficients. I mean, if somebody, I mean, yeah, I'm sure people have. Sure, but that seems an important question. Yes. Do you, do you have a quick question? Yeah. So how, how do you think about those uh, in relation to other biomarkers of aging? I've heard like Eileen Crimmins talking about like biological age. Yes, yes. Biomarks that are not epigenetics. And I know yes. one of the main drawbacks is that like, treatment might affect those a lot. Like I hmm. heard about blood pressure, right? How huh. medicine yes. for blood pressure kind of decrease the relationship between age and hypertension. Mm -hmm. and how kind of how do you think about are are these maybe less you would you say these are less likely to be affected by those? secular trends or by treatment by disease treatment or do you think I think what do you think about those? I think it still be I think it could still be affected by disease treatment definitely I mean I, I think your because your epigenome could change based on that um, but again this is like these betas are the average across a large you know uh, pool you know 18,000 samples so um, you know and some are children some are adults so it's like consistent across the population that these are associated with age regardless of maybe what any individual Person. So I think it does tend to be more robust than like a, um, you know, other biomarkers of aging that have been constructed. Because yeah, in, in geroscience, I mean, this is a huge field. Biomarkers of aging is like, so, um, and uh, Morgan Levine has developed a, a DNA methylation pheno age that instead of using chronological age, she used um, an actual uh, phenotypic measure of age that was combining all these different um, you know, uh, well-used biomarkers of aging, and her clock is even more predictive, so it's even more exact because I think she was able to get even more closely to some of the biological. Um, so people typically use DNA methylation phenoage or other ones. Um. Okay, I'm almost done, and then we can have a few more questions. Um, so this next slide is very important. Uh, so here now, okay, we have this methylation predictor of age. But what's actually usually used in the literature is age acceleration. Um, and that is just formally the residual from regressing that DNA methylation age on chronological age. And so then what you get, so it's just basically the, the difference there, and, and what you get then is a positive or a negative value for, for a person. So if the, if the value is positive, highly positive, if DNA methylation age, for example, is greater than chronological age, um, then 
uh, you are aging faster than your chronological age. If it's negative, then you're aging slower. Um, and so it's these age acceleration measures that have actually been used a lot to assess factors associated with faster biological aging. And there's been a whole slew of studies, and they found that age acceleration is associated with a wide range of age-related diseases and, and even mortality. Um, so pretty much any age, you know, aging phenotype you can think of, which is pretty much any disease, uh, has been shown to be associated, but some more so than others. So what's interesting, for example, is that obesity is, is much more associated with age acceleration than smoking. So um, some are more so than others. Uh, so in terms of kind of where the field's going and, and some critiques of this, what I think is really interesting is that these clocks, and, and to date there's over 11 epigenetic clocks that have been developed. I think now there's even more. Um, but uh, the, the CPG sites that they're finding are not consistent. So there have been over 1,600 CPG sites identified across all these different aging clocks, um, but only two CPG sites overlap across all 11 clocks, and the clocks are actually not really highly correlated. Uh, so a big question is why is this? Um, could they be capturing different aspects or pathways of aging? Um, it could also be that it was because they were constructed in really different samples and across different proportions of tissue types. Um, you know, there's no reason to assume that all organs in our body are aging at the same rate, for example. Uh, so how does that affect these clocks? Um, and here's just a list of all the 11 clocks. And then so Morgan Levine and some colleagues are actually digging deeper into looking at some of the functional analysis behind this and seeing, you know, uh, are, whether these clocks are tagging different genes, for example, and so forth. Um, and so um, I'm also looking at this, at, but looking kind of at whether the underlying social environment, the underlying samples that were used to construct these uh, might have been influencing some of the CPG sites that were uh, picked and collected, so and, and whether those then confer different pathways of aging. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of open questions here about these clocks. Yes? Are there any, like, are there any of those that are, like, longitudinal tests? Oh, I guess it's similar to the pandemic. They're taking five grams longitudinal. Over time with their age acceleration measure, you mean? I'm sure there had, at some point, has been a longitudinal study that's been done. I, I can't think, I mean, because that's a really good, I think it's a really good question. I haven't, um, I'll have to look and get back to you because it seems like by now there should have been, but there's not, maybe in the Lothian birth cohort, do they have longitudinal? There's just not a lot of um, longitudinal epigenetic data right now, um, but. It's only recent there was a fourth one. Right? Yeah, exactly, that it was even. How much does it cost per birth? I think it's around 200 now, I think. But you know, the cost is always going down. Um, so it's still cheaper, but um, it's, uh, genotyping is still way cheaper, but um, it's always going down. Um, but yeah, I think there, there will be more longitudinal data soon. Um, so I think some open questions in, in this field is uh, to what extent do genetic processes, again, affect age acceleration? Um, right now, Horvath is doing another GWAS of age acceleration that's currently underway. I think he's hoping to get something like 50,000 samples. Um, there was one that was done already, and uh, he talks about some of the genes that they, they found in that um, review paper that I assigned, if you're interested. Um, and, uh, you know, I think another question, again, is are these epigenetic processes causally related to phenotypic manifestations of aging? That is something that we still don't know. There's a lot of studies in animal models that are underway, but I think, you know, there's more need for longitudinal epigenetic data in humans to really kind of tease some of this out and causal research designs. So uh, now I just have a slide kind of for discussion. Um, I know we're kind of up on time, so maybe there's not a whole lot of time, but I think these are kind of just some, some open questions that I'd be interested in talking to you all more about. Um, you know, what are some ways that you think social scientists can use epigenetic data to enhance their research? Um, you know, what tools do we have at our disposal that we could use to enhance study design? Um, you know, and, and really what is the value added of using epigenetic data in social science research? Um, so, Looking forward to talking to you all more about this. Do we have time for a few questions, or do you want to? Sure. Couple. So, Jonathan. So, for the age acceleration, uh, have people explored to an extent this correlates with year growth in the site? Um, a, like, which ones are you like? Education, education yes. Okay. Yes. It's, it's not. So, uh, obesity, it's highly, highly correlated with obesity, not so much with smoking, which is interesting. That seems to be a really different 
thing that's going on in the methylome. Um, and then with education, it's, it's not as strong as you would think, but it's a little bit, it's there. But I, I hope to do... I, I, I think that's one place, social science. Yeah, no, and that's, I wrote... I suspect you wrote that. I, I agree. No, I agree. And so that was part of the, the grant, my K that I wrote like a couple of years ago. That's what I pitched is looking more at the socioeconomic environment, how it's associated with epigenetic age and, and using causal research designs. So I hope to dig into that more. And I think with the HRS data that's coming down the pipeline, we'll be able to have some interesting studies that come out. So at the beginning, you mentioned there were like two ways to use this data. One's biomarkers, mm -hmm. um, seems promising, and the other one's mediated. Mediators, yeah, modifiers, maybe. Uh, we don't really know. Is there evidence for stimulation mediated? And what should we think of I mean, I think that there, I don't know like how to answer that from a broad sense. I think in animal models, it's more clear that, you know, where they can really, you know, kind of look at the environmental exposure, you know, the, and they have shown that. Um, I mean, I think that it's still kind of an open question, really. I think there's evidence for both ways because there's, it's just really dynamic and it depends on the gene, it depends on the exposure, depends on the time point. Um, but there certainly is evidence for it being a mediator. But it, I mean, a lot, I think it's important to look at the animal studies if you're really interested in, in digging into it because in humans, there just hasn't been the longitudinal data that we need to really look into it. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, exactly. That's changing gene expression in some way. I mean, that is the definition of epigenetics. So it's it is something that's mod you know changing gene expression. Um, and so whether to think about that as a mediator or a moderator, you know, I mean, these are all things that I'm kind of still thinking about. What I'm thinking is that Positive, Absolutely, yeah. No, they're like things like exercise, for example, where they find methylation on different, that could be something that positively suppresses genes that are harmful. And that, yeah, there's definitely a lot of epigenetic functions that have been shown to be good in that way, that we need them turned on. We need that, those sites methylated. So it's not always a bad thing, yeah. I have a question about the table uh, with the clock and the correlation between the clock. There are some lines that are like types, like one, one, three, six. Is that like the genetic equivalence of candidate? Like, yeah, yeah. I guess, and I, uh, yeah, it's interesting that there's only one. I mean, these were kind of very early clocks that were developed. Um, yeah, I mean, they wouldn't call it candidate gene research, but yeah. I mean, I don't think those clocks are as robust. I mean, like, well, yeah, should we expect like higher correlation if they are constructed one or three or eight sites or even 70 sites? Is this uh, uh... So this Hanum clock is actually is quite good. Um, but again, it's like some, they're, they're all kind of slightly predictive of different things. And yeah, so I mean, it's, it's just, it's not robust. You know, that was kind of with this slide, what I wanted to show was that, yeah, exact, it's not, you know, it's not like these are the CPG sites and that's it. They're all finding slightly different CPG sites. Um, it's kind of like in GWAS as, you know, power increased, you know, they found sometimes the things replicated, sometimes they didn't. Some GWAS find the same genes, sometimes they don't, so. I don't think it's that surprising that there is not that much overlap with the CPG sites because there's a high degree of correlation in the epigenome. And so mm -hmm. it could be, I think what's happening here is a lot of the clocks are, are you know, they may be picking up the same signal, but using different CPG sites to, to um, tag that, that signal. But it is surprising that the clocks don't, are not that correlated with each other. Right. I think it's, I think it's not um, as, as far as, and, and this paper of hers is on BioArchive, but, and I think, you know, I was looking into it, they, they do actually find very different um, gene pathways too across these clocks. So it's not even that they're tagging, um, you know, similar sites that are implicated with similar gene, with a similar gene or something like you would expect with LD. Um, so it's, it's not, it is slightly different in that way. They do seem to be capturing different processes, but they're all highly correlated with age. So it's, it can be that, but I, I mean, to differing degrees. Like for example, pheno age, I think is, is, is the best performing out of all of them. And then the, the Horvath clock and, you know, I mean, they were constructed in different types of tissue. 
Okay. Would give if, if they're if if they're not correlated with each other, then they can't be all highly correlated with age, just because you like a right. correlation matrix. Wouldn't like positive definiteness constraints. Right, right. No, I see. I think because the they're not all exactly correlated with age at the same level, so the correlations differ, and um, some are stronger. I think it's up to a 0.95 correlation with age, and I think that's phenoage. age. And that's the one you mentioned that, that it's with the body. Yes, okay. yes, yep. So you would use that one if you had. I think so. Yeah, I I would use a couple of different ones though, just to show the robustness of my results because um, they might be. We don't quite know yet what 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 they mean. And I think that was like, I talked to Maureen about this, and she's like, yeah, I think we still don't know what this means. We don't know what are these CPG sites? What are they doing? Um, but, uh, these are population specific. Yes, yes. So I imagine there's probably a lot of variance of the correlation with age. It's not like you're testing across population. And then the these are within the data set chosen by the Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been applied to a lot of different population cohorts, and it tends to just always be really to the point where in, in this review paper, he says uh, that people are even using it in the medical field now, uh, or even that they're using it um, as a way to identify uh, batch effects that basically if the chronological age doesn't align with the epigenetic sample, for example, they can pick that out if the age is not aligned with with methylation age, so it's 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 really pretty highly, really robust. Even across ancestry. Um, yeah, and even across ancestry. So that's the other thing that like we didn't even touch on here is ancestry effects, which I get think is also a huge open thing in epigenetics. They they don't they just pool everyone together. So there's there's no consideration of ancestry differences in, in epigenetics, not like there is in genetics, um, even though there could potentially be really huge ancestry effects. I don't know. How you could use EWAS. Yeah, so um, I guess what I was thinking about there is that basically um, you have some sort of measure that some sort of association between a phenotype and, um, you know, and a CPG site, some sort of outcome. Um, you could then look at for that phenotype, uh, you know, a polygenic score, for example, and see how much, you know, of, of that is left over even after we control for the polygenic score. And, and, and then you could kind of start to assess, okay, you know, what's explained by uh, the epigenetics, what's explained by the, the polygenic score for this particular phenotype? Um, do they interact? Uh, you know, those types of questions. That's how I would think about it. But I think everybody in here probably has a different way that they might think about it. Um, but because, again, it's, it's, it's part of the pathway to gene expression, you can somehow use it to, to back out, you know, interesting uh, relationships between gene expression and, and a phenotype and, and genotype. So it's, you know, these are all molecular layers of this process. So how could you use these molecular layers to kind of think more about the relationship between a gene and a phenotype, for example? Yeah. Does anyone else have a way that they might think about it? Using it, epigenetics, or some ways that they think are promising, maybe or exciting. You don't have to answer it now either, but yeah. we can talk about it after. Will you be around yeah. for dinner? Because I have like twenty questions, but I don't. Think yes. Don't yes. 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 Hours next. Yes, and we're gonna have office hours next. So I think, do we have to end now? Or okay, sorry guys, but yeah, come talk to me. Thank you. So,